we are TAXI, the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, and we believe that all people deserve social and economic participation. Uh, but uh, there are naughty social, socio-economic problems that hold back that participation, and therefore their people's prosperity as well as our collective prosperity. There, some of those naughty, wicked problems include child neglect and abuse, intergenerational unemployment, and indigenous disadvantage. <clears throat> what we do is we build the capability to untie those knots. And things that we work on are better defining problems, uh, better solutions that work, uh, we're very um, invested in evaluation, which you'll see come through today. Better systems to spread what works once those solutions are designed. Uh, innovation capability to do those things, not, not for us, but for our clients and the communities that we serve. And uh, how we catalyze action within systems. You will probably see several definitions as you come to these events around co-design, design thinking, user-centered design. We use co-design and we, we say that it is a methodology for human-centered innovation and that it is not a methodology for engagement. So we are about developing and delivering solutions together. So how did we get involved in this project? <coughs> In 2014, the Department of Employment uh, launched a new version of their uh, mainstream unemployment scheme, and it's called Job Active. Job Active uh, changed a lot in um, in that sector. Uh, it um, compared to previous. Uh, types of contracts. It was an outcomes-based contract. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that term, uh, but that changes how the sector works. Uh, but they also, at that point in time, just wanted to be do their part to contribute to closing the gap. And, <clears throat> and as part of that, within this contract, for the first time ever, they put in place indigenous outcome targets. So what that means is that they... Um, if you are measuring outcomes, an, an employment outcome is that you are, um, <clears throat> job seekers are employed at 4, 12, 26 weeks and providers get paid at 4, 12 and 26 weeks. And so that's paying for the performance of getting those job seekers to those outcomes. And so for the first time ever, they were measuring how well providers were actually performing against indigenous outcome targets. And uh, it took a little while for the sector to get used to all of that change. And uh, it also um, took a little while for everyone to get used to focusing on indigenous outcomes. There had previously been indigenous specialists and now the entire market was being asked to focus on uh, indigenous peoples. And so they, um, after about two years, they were seeing changes, they were seeing shifts, but they felt like they could do better. And so that's when they invited us in. <coughs> the project that we ran was a, an early a discovery, an early stage user-centered design project. Um, user-centered design is what the department calls their, um, the methodology that they use. Uh, <coughs> and so as you can see, through the phases of innovation, discover, design, trial, and spread, which are what um, taxi will work towards. Uh, this project just went through discovery and early stage design. We established three different field work locations, <clears throat> but the project was actually conducted on the lands of the Ghana, the Naranjari, the Darug, the Gadigal, and the Nanawa peoples. So we had, <clears throat> um, we did field work in Mount Druitt, North Adelaide, and Playford, uh, South of, sorry, sorry, North Adelaide slash Playford, South Australia, and then Murray Bridge, South Australia. Um, <coughs> the project team was co-located in Canberra, and we also um, have our office here in Sydney, but we also did interviews here and workshops here in Sydney as well. <coughs> 
we, the, the department, and you'll see this when Hannah speaks in her video, the department has been working to take a uh, user-centered approach for some time, and for them that makes taking a holistic approach to the different perspectives within the sector about the service that you are experiencing. And so <clears throat> they, we therefore spoke to providers, which didn't just mean job active providers, it also meant non-job active providers, um, training organizations, indigenous employment specialists. Then we also spoke to employers. So we spoke to large employers as well as small micro, you know, two-man shops. Uh, we spoke to job seekers. And we also spoke to Aboriginal community organizations and other government areas such as DPNC. The project lasted about seven months. Uh, it had a number of different phases, but in particular, we had three sprints of field work. Uh, so we'd go out into the field, we would learn something, we would c come back, we'd make sense of it, we'd redesign our approach based on a focus, a, a deeper level of understanding, we'd go out. Uh, so this first sprint, that's meeting and listening to people, we, um, <clears throat> we spent a lot of time making sure that people understood that we were not there to just listen and take away and never come back. We wanted to listen, come back and share, here's what you heard you said, now tell us what's important. So that's what we did in sprint two. We shared with them what we heard and we validated what the priorities were from their perspective. <clears throat> and then we went back, we did a phase of design, and then we went back out and did co-design and testing together with employers, uh, providers, and in the last phase, we were finally able to work with job seekers. And I say finally, <coughs> because we, um, <coughs> we had an ethics process that was part of this, and it took us that distance to, to be able to actually um, get approval to work with the job seekers. Uh, and Tobias will tell you more about that. But so three sprints. Over the course of that, more than 50 interviews, nine rapid ethnography sessions with job seekers, 10 prototyping sessions with job seekers, and 10 workshops with the sector. <clears throat> the team was highly multidisciplinary from different parts of employment um, among our team as well. Uh, we invested very much in capability building for the Department of Employment and uh, as I said, an independent ethics committee and an external evaluator, which Anna will tell you about. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> I don't think it's gonna make anything better. Um, <coughs> so I'm not going to necessarily read through all of these, but the, the research, the insights, all of the ideas were very much developed on the perspective of our job seekers, our employers, and our providers. They, all of that material came from them, was generated by them, and when we play it back to them, it will be in their voice and in their language. <clears throat> Out of that, we came with five themes. So the first theme is walking in both. So the five themes <coughs> pertain to, and that help answer the question, if a provider were to change their actions in order to better achieve indigenous employment outcomes, what might they do? So the first four are specifically for providers. The last one is actually for the Department of Employment. So for providers, uh, as well as employers actually, um, when an indigenous person is employed in mainstream employment in Australia, they are asked to walk in two worlds. And <clears throat> the mainstream employment culture, as well as uh, maintain and stay true to what is important to them within their own culture. And in order for them to do this, the providers and the employers also need to be able to walk in those both worlds with them. And, <clears throat> and so for someone to walk in both worlds, it means that the person that is working with you actually and I won't say step into your shoes because that's disrespectful, actually. Actually takes the time to learn what, what is of significance to you and to your culture uh, and then understands how to help you bridge that. <clears throat> the second theme is setting job seekers up for success. Job search as supported by unemployment agencies is not just about 
finding the right job. Job search actually re requires specific skills, like computer skills, basic computer skills, cut and paste, using CAPTCHA fields, remembering your passwords. Some of our job seekers don't have those skills. They haven't ever needed them. They've maybe worked manual labor all their lives. Um, <clears throat> then also, you have things like they need to be able to, um, to, to put forth a really good resume. They need to understand uh, the specific language that comes with the job application process. And underneath this, you'll see there is um, a wonderful series of insights that pertain to uh, the importance of driver's licenses for um, a lot of indigenous job seekers. Many of them do not have them, and it's one of the biggest barriers to, um, to employment, actually. <clears throat> Pursue the best match. So providers have to match job seekers with employers, and that is a skill, and that is an expertise, and that is a, those are relationships. So there are, there are many different strategies that go into that. Uh, also, addressing job seeker life barriers. So you could do all of these things, but if someone is homeless, you are not going to help them stay in a job. So you actually have to address that first before long term or even any employment is possible. <clears throat> but sometimes those things involve a lot of trauma and those are not necessarily things that uh, employment uh, consultants are equipped for. So this is where they need to know where, who is available out there in Sydney, in the greater Western Sydney region. Who's there for support? They need to know and know how to also diffuse situations should they arise. Um, <clears throat> then the last one for the department. How might the department facilitate change to the model? Uh, employers and providers identified a number of ways where they felt like um, the department had taken great steps and that they could actually continue to build on it. And so it was, this is a series of ideas for how to actually continue progressing the work. This is the limit of what I'm able to share with you right now in terms of our findings. We haven't yet um, published our findings publicly. If you would like to receive that, when it is published, just give us your email address and we would be happy to send it to you. The first step is that we need to, f to finish it, to finish, the <laughs> finish our findings, um, and we need to then share it with participants. That's part of our ethics commitment. Um, <clears throat> but if you would like the actual <coughs> findings, we will share them when they're available. All right, so what I'd like to show you now is our clients' <coughs> reflections on some of these topics. So you'll hear some of the things that I've just said again, but you'll hear them in her words. <coughs> so this Hannah Matner from the Department of Employment, her role is <coughs> to, she works within a business improvement area and she is a designer that is embedded there and, and their job is then to, to be almost a, a shared services to different policy areas who want to use design as a tool. And so I need to step over here and set up the video and you will see Hannah talk about this. And I do apologize, it's a longer video than we would normally play, but we'd wanted, she's, she couldn't come, she's on a flight right now, so she, we wanted you to hear it from her perspective. Special <clears throat> Design Sydney. My name is Hannah Matner. I'm part of the Department of Employment and specifically the team that worked with Taxi and Clear Horizons on the Improving Indigenous Employment Outcomes project. I'm going to be giving you some more context tonight on sort of where the project came from from a government perspective and also what our experience and my personal experience was with being part of the project team. I want to start first with sort of the two drivers for the project coming together. The main one here was that um, in the current contract for employment services, a job active. We have targets for improving Indigenous employment outcomes. And these have been in place for a few years now and are making a difference in this space, but not as big a difference as we'd like. Um, so we've seen that they've renewed the focus on helping Indigenous job seekers and kicked off a really significant shift in how providers work to support them. But that shift has been challenging for everyone involved. And while that great work is being done, we really want to, to push it further and to meet those targets. At the same time, we've been experimenting as a department with you know, 
better recognising in our systems and in the way we work the importance of understanding the individual perspectives of job seekers, of employment consultants and other job service providers, of employers and all of the other different groups that contribute in this space. Um, and just ultimately getting that holistic understanding of the employment ecosystem so that we can work with everyone involved there to create holistic responses that are grounded in what can practically work in the community. So bringing these two goals within the department together, it seemed like a really natural fit for a major user-centred design project that starts looking at how to apply that methodology in the project space and really make, um, make users the heart of our policy making process. And of course, taxi was a natural fit as our guide through this really complicated space. So when I look at the difference that what we heard made in the team, I keep going back to something that one of my team members said to me in the car on the way home. And as someone who typically works with policies and reports and information at a great remove, he turned around and went, you know, we've heard these stories before, but hearing it from real people it comes from a much more sincere place. It's an actual person rather than this aggregate. And that really reflects my experience on the project as well. Uh, I keep talking about it as everything's now 12 stories deep. Before we knew, or before I knew, that that relationship between um, someone looking for work and the employment consultant that helps them find that could make a real difference and be that make or break factor in how someone progressed. But talking to people about it, it became really evident that that human connection, uh, or, or I've got a lot more examples in my mind of the, the diverse ways that that human connection makes a difference, from um, the lady who thought that some criminal history in her past really meant that she could never aspire to the sorts of caring jobs she was passionate about again. Um, and when her employment consultants finally worked with her and found that out and had that connection around it, really sort of went, oh, we can help you there. We think that's possible. Talk to the local hospital. Um, and the day we talked to her, she was preparing for an interview there. Um, through to another fellow who had some real challenges going from um, people who'd been hugely supportive to people he didn't connect with and back again, and seeing how that was the core thing he referred to in our conversations about, about his experiences. So it brought new understanding and broader thinking and perspectives to the knowledge that we already have. So as I'm sure you've got the impression of, um, doing this project was a really significant shift in our um, usual way of working and so a really big capability build for both the core team that were working full time on the project but also the subject matter experts who came in and lent their own expertise during the field work. Um, and that field work was the really big shift for all of us, just having that direct exposure to the people who'd be impacted by our work, that ability to see how they interacted with the things the department did as part of their everyday lives was a really big turning point for all of us. One of the things that we experienced that um, we'd be really careful about, particularly for doing design in larger organisations again, was the impact of having to adapt on the fly and be really confident with the ambiguity in what we did. So it's, as I'm sure you're aware of, at least from stereotype, very much the nature of government to have set decision-making and clearance processes as yeah, part of the way we manage risk. Um, and so that was a major shift for our team members to sort of go, right, here I am with a job seeker or a job service provider and I'm in conversation with them. That's not something where I can get my words checked and cleared and pass that through someone. That's just got to happen as we go. So having that confidence in our knowledge and our ability to engage in that way, but also that ability to, um, to have conversations and training and processes set up so that we knew what was appropriate, what was not, was really important there. And that's all. <laughs> so um, Hannah had a number of other points which we may bring up when we talk about um, 
ethics or evaluation. But overall, where where the department is at with it now is that we have given them um, a number of recommendations and uh, <coughs> and they are working through, um, they're very, very tangible recommendations and now they're working through how they might then action those. Um, it's not a matter of whether or not they'll action them, it's at which ones and how quickly. <laughs> so. Uh, so now I will put the, put the PowerPoint back on and I will hand it over to Anna Powell from Clear Horizon to talk to you about evaluation.